to me. Every nation must be saved. I hear God singing to me. Every challenge must be raised. I feel God's spirit in me. Quenching not too much at stake. I hear God singing to me. I hear God sing for Jesus' sake. I hear God sing for Jesus' sake. Sunday virtual worship service. We are grateful and joyful that you can be with us online. If you're visiting, greetings and thank you for watching. We are the Amaya family. Freddie, Mari, Alex, Bea. <laughs> Bea. You know, Romans 15, verse 7, the Bible reads, Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. You know, we bring praise to God through our worship time. We celebrate His greatness, goodness, faithfulness, promises, and of course, His unconditional love. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we want to thank you so much for this time together. 
Thank you for the fact that you bless us so much, even for not allowing technology to evolve to this level so we can worship virtually. Thank you so much for every aspect of the service that we're going to be receiving today from the contribution to the message to, of course, the Lord's Supper. Be with us. Help our hearts to be open wide, God, so we can receive your word and definitely do something great with it. We love you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Kate. And I'm Carly. Say, Kate, have you ever not wanted to do something your parents told you to do, so you have a really bad attitude about it? I definitely have, Carly. I also struggle with a lot of other sins, like being honest. Sometimes my parents will tell me to clean my room, and, you know, sometimes I don't want to do it, so I tell them I did when I really didn't. Yeah, totally. That's a really common thing to struggle with. I actually was reading my Bible today, and I came across a scripture that would really help with that. Ephesians 6.11 Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Wow, that was a really good scripture. Yeah, totally. It will definitely help with the challenges and sins that Satan throws at me. Yeah, I can definitely see how I can apply that to myself. But wait, what would happen if you didn't have the armor of God? Well... <laughs> Oh man, sin does not feel good. But if you have the armor of God. attitude or struggle not to disobey your parents, put on the full armor of God by praying, reading your Bible, or memorizing a scripture. Yeah, and try to memorize the one that we memorized today. Yeah, Ephesians 6 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. And make sure to send in pictures of your armor of God. Get some things around your house and make your own. We would love to see what you guys come up with. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Bye! Lord of all creation Of water, earth, and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy Declares 
your majesty. Good morning, church. I'm Wayne Fite, and this is my beautiful wife, Gina. And it is our honor and pleasure to share our thoughts as we remember Jesus and commune with God at this time. Remembering Jesus can be a time of conviction, a time of refreshment, and a time of worship all at once. For communion, we set aside some time in our heart to realign our thoughts and attitudes with God's. And at the same time, we drink in the grace of God and we are nourished by his kindness, forgiveness, and love through the body of Christ. We, are both, we were both baptized back in 1991. And for us, remembering Jesus is just as important today as it was that year we committed our life to his will. Hebrews 7, 25 through 26 says, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he, he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Amen. Remembering Jesus nudges us in the direction of gratefulness and awakens the Holy Spirit that we received as a gift. Remembering Jesus also humbles us to know that we have a God and a Lord who loves each of us endlessly and has shown us the way to love others. Gina would like to share some thoughts about this. Thanks. For me, this time of communion, remembering Jesus from his birth to the cross, that helps me stay grounded. It shows me how to be joyful always. It teaches me how to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. It fills me with peace. Following Jesus gives me a direction to head in and hopefully leads others in the right direction too. Because of Jesus, I get to have an incredible and deep relationship with God. I've been singing the song Waymaker a lot lately it's easy to feel like the world is going down the tubes. It's a dark place. When I start to feel overwhelmed by the troubles of the world, I sing this song. And every time I do, I tear up because of my gratitude for God's presence in my life. And I'm renewed in my faith. These are some of the words that really um, impact me. When I don't, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. These words are encouraging and powerful. Thanks be to Jesus that we have a personal relationship with God. We get to have this incredible gift of communion with one another to be unified in our proclamation that Jesus is our everything. Let's take time to remember this. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, as we remember Jesus, please soften our hearts at this time. 
Allow us to be still and listen to your spirit to guide us. We love you, Father, and are grateful for the juice and the bread that reminds us of our loving Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we continue to worship God, our offering gives us the opportunity to to respond in gratitude to the grace, love, and mercy of God, and to put our faith and trust in the Lord into action. Our offering is one way that we partner with God to spread the gospel of healing, the gospel of freedom, and the gospel of salvation. God is the ultimate in demonstrating generosity. Philippians 2 five through eight says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for your loving generosity. I pray that our offering will be pleasing to you and used wisely to be aligned with your will and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Esther's story in the Bible is an amazing story of a young woman who had to show courage in order to save her people. It's a story with twists and turns and suspense and ultimately good triumphing over evil. You know, while Esther was debating whether or not to put herself out there and potentially face death, these words were spoken to her. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone out of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, 
Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. You know, Esther took these words to heart and knew that she was created for just this moment and in just this time. God is always looking for people that will join him in his mission of deliverance. In a time where our world is filled with so much fear, uncertainty, and divisions, let us be women that consider what God is calling us to do for such a time as this. Please join us on March 6th at 10 a.m. for a special webinar that will hopefully inspire us to take courage like Esther and to join God in his mission of redemption. We will hear from women right in our own neighborhoods about how they are stepping up in their own lives for such a time as this. God is calling each one of you to a great rescue story, and he deems each one of you worthy of the calling. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the virtual worship service of the Midpoint Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. As many of you know, we as the Midpoint Ministry Center are taking the first two months of this year to dissect, analyze, and examine our vision statement as the Chicago Church of Christ. And this is what our vision statement says. We envision generations of wholehearted disciples intent on loving God and embracing the cross, Surrender to Jesus, committed to his mission, determined to discover their God-given gifts to serve his kingdom and advance the gospel, and who accept his call to give up everything, go anywhere, do anything, and become whatever God calls them to be. Up to this point, a sermon has been preached on what it means to be a wholehearted disciple. A sermon has been preached on what it means to be intent on loving God. Likewise, sermons have been preached on what it means to embrace the cross and to be surrendered to Jesus. The portion of our vision statement that I'll be preaching about this morning has to do with the mission. Now, perhaps some of you are thinking, here we are with a, uh, here we go with another sermon about the mission. Haven't we heard all there is to say about the mission? And exactly what verses come to mind when you think about the mission? Most of us are hard pressed to name more than the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. For years, our church culture has singled out this passage as the end-all and be-all passage about the mission. Well, before you jump to a conclusion about what I'm going to talk about as it pertains to the mission, let me state the title of my sermon as it relates to our vision statement. The title of my sermon is Committed to His Mission. Again, our vision statement says, we envision generations of wholehearted disciples intent on loving God and embracing the cross, surrender to Jesus, committed to his mission. It's easy to think that we as disciples have a mission, which of course we do, but the reason we have a mission is because God has a mission. An author by the name of Christopher Wright, who wrote a book titled, The Mission of God's People, a Biblical Theology of the Church's Mission, makes the connection between having a proper understanding of our mission as disciples and properly understanding God's mission. In his book, he writes, our mission flows from God's mission. So we have to start by seeing ourselves within the great flow of God's mission. And we must make sure that our own missional goals, long-term or more immediate, are in line with God's. For that purpose, we need to know the story we are a part of, the great story that the Bible tells that encompasses the past and the future. Our mission as disciples flows from God's mission. And what exactly has been God's mission since the dawn of creation? 
Since the dawn of creation, God's mission has been to fill the earth with a great multitude of people living in worship of him. Since the dawn of creation, God's mission has been to fill the earth with a great multitude of people living in worship of him. Our mission as the wholehearted disciples of which we are all striving to be flows from God's mission. And I love the author's point about how we as disciples have to start by seeing ourselves, seeing ourselves within the great flow of God's mission, and that we need to know the story we are a part of, the great story that the Bible tells that encompasses the past and the future. So with all that being said, in my sermon this morning, I want to talk about the great story of God's mission within the context of the Bible. God's mission is not something that the Bible merely speaks about. God's mission is what the Bible is about. It is in the context of the whole Bible from cover to cover that we find God's mission and our mission as disciples. And in talking about God's mission this morning, I hope to inspire us as disciples to be committed to his mission. I hope to inspire us as disciples to be willing and, and grateful participants within the great flow of God's mission. So if you will, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Again, our mission as disciples flows from God's mission. And since the dawn of creation, God's mission has been to fill the earth with a great multitude of people living in worship of him, glorifying his name. In the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, we read about the creation of the earth along with the creation of people, namely our first parents, Adam and Eve. God begins in Genesis by commanding Adam and Eve to fill the earth Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 from the Bible reads, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. Since the very beginning, brothers and sisters, it has always been God's mission to have the entire earth be filled with a great multitude of people living in worship of him. However, we know that by Genesis chapter 3 of the Bible, sin had crept in and damaged God's relationship with the people he created. Sadly, by the time we reached Genesis 8 of the Bible, Genesis chapter 8 of the Bible, things on earth were not looking so good. Things on earth were not looking so good. There was great rebellion against God on the part of the people on earth at that time. As history continued, there was a, a growing crescendo of, of rebellion, sin, and wickedness. In chapters 6 through 9 of the book of Genesis, is where we read about God, God's judgment on the earth by way of the great flood and his, his sparing of Noah and his family. But as God floods the earth and starts over with Noah, listen to the command that he gives Noah just after he steps off of the ark. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 from the Bible reads, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. What we see is that God's mission to fill the earth with a great multitude of people living in worship of him remain the same. As we come to Genesis chapter 11, the effects of sin were still very present and the people on earth continued to walk in great defiance to God, resulting in the, the foolish attempt to build a tower to heaven. Genesis chapter 11, verse one through four explains this entire ordeal. It reads, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for martyr. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, it's important to notice that at this time, the whole world is speaking only one language as one group of people, only one language as one group of people. The idea of different nations of people did, did not exist yet. Nevertheless, the whole world at this time was, was living in direct defiance to God by failing to fill the earth according to his command. But instead of wiping them out like he did once before, God, he, he responds with a plan of mercy and creativity. What God did was he confuses the language they all spoke and he organizes them into diverse nations. 
of people, scattering them all over the face of the earth. According to Genesis chapter 11, verse 7 through 8, God said, Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. But what about God's mission to fill the, the whole earth with people living in worship of him? Granted, people were now located all over the face of the earth. People, they were not living in worship of God, were they? You know, from the looks of things, God seemed to be failing at his mission. Although all seemed unredeemable due to what I described as a as this as a, a growing crescendo of rebellion, sin, and wickedness on the part of the people at that time, although all seemed unredeemable, what God did next was He initiates uh, he, he initiates a plan to set aside another man and his family, like He did with Noah and his family, to do what to advance His mission. Genesis chapter twelve verse. One through three from the Bible explains the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land. I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you. I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. With his mission always at the forefront of his mind. God promised to grow this man's family through his children and his children's children into a great nation of its own with descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and, and the sand on the seashore. And through Abraham, whom or through Abraham, whom later would be called Abraham, which non coincidentally means father of multitudes. That's what Abraham means. Father of multitudes. Through him, God was going to advance his mission to fill the whole earth with a great multitude of people who would be living in worship of him. But how was this plan going to work out, especially being that Abraham at the time was very old and didn't even have children, right? We know that about Abraham and his story. The truth is, Abraham at the time being very old and not having children wasn't even God's biggest concern when it came to Abraham. And we know this based on the one command God gave Abraham. God gave Abraham only one command, and that command was to go. And where was Abraham supposed to go? Truth be told, God wasn't terribly precise about that at the time. God only said, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. However, what we can miss is the fact that God was calling Abraham to leave behind his father and the rest of his, his family, particularly for one reason. God was calling Abraham to leave behind his father and the rest of his family, particularly because of their worship of other gods. From the book of Joshua in the Bible, in chapter 24, verse 2 through 3, we learn this crucial detail. We learn this crucial detail right here. Speaking directly to descendants of Abraham, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. When it came to Abraham, God called, called Abraham to make a break with his family. He called him to make a break with his family in their worship of other gods. And in doing so, God promised Abraham he would make him a great nation, blessing him and making his name great. However, God's offer to Abraham was more than fame or fortune. It was more than fame and fortune. Rather, God was offering Abraham a new life, a new life of serving and worshiping the one true and living God. Which goes back to God's mission for all people from the very beginning. And although Abraham couldn't see what God was going to do, and although Abraham didn't know how God was going to use him, Abraham's decision to give up everything and put his faith in God, to put his faith in Yahweh against all odds, against the unknown, against his family, and against the idolatrous culture of his times, served to advance God's mission. It served to advance God's mission. 
Abraham's faith and obedience to God served to advance God's mission. Because the larger purpose behind commanding Abraham to go from his country, his people and his father's household was to what? Was to be a blessing. Remember, God told Abraham, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God intended to bless all peoples on earth. He intended to reach all nations through Abraham and his family in keeping with his mission. God called Abraham to join him in his mission to reach the godless nations of people that had been scattered throughout the earth. And watch how God continued to call the descendants of Abraham to join in his mission to reach all nations. For example, next in line was Abraham's son, Isaac, to whom God repeats the command in Genesis 26, verse 4, which reads, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And to Isaac's son, Jacob, Genesis chapter 28, verse 14 reads, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. God was advancing his mission through everyone in Abraham's family in keeping with this promise that all peoples on the earth will be blessed through them. And how exactly would God bless all peoples on earth through Abraham and his family? Well, as we know, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham's family. And if there was ever a descendant of Abraham who would most serve to advance God's mission, to fill the earth with a great multitude of people living in worship of God, if there, if there ever was a descendant of Abraham who would do that, that was Jesus. That person was Jesus. And as we look at Jesus, we see through him, God, God's mission remained the same. When we look at Jesus, you know, whether it was Jesus taking the longer route to reach a Samaritan woman whom he had told, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Or, you know, or if it was Jesus entering the temple courts in Jerusalem and, and driving out those who were buying and selling there. You know, the Bible says that Jesus overturned tables of many of the, the money changers and the, the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. In other words, they were shutting people out from other nations from worshiping God, of which God's purpose for the temple for people was, was for people from all over the whole world to come and worship him. That was the purpose of the temple. Also, as we look at Jesus, we see Jesus' ministry was, was governed by a principle of making the kingdom of God known everywhere. You know, to areas that had not yet heard about the kingdom of God. He was like, we need to go to those areas. You know, you look at Luke 4, verse 42 through 43. Jesus, he gives this as a reason for leaving a certain city where there were still a lot of needs. There was a lot of needs in that city, but this was his reason for wanting to leave. The people there were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving, but he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Like his forefather Abraham, Jesus was willing to go wherever God wanted him to go to make God known. When it came to both Abraham and Jesus, it's clear that their missions flowed from God's mission. They both understood that God wants nothing more than the earth to be filled with people of all nations living in worship of him. They both understood that. And it is with that understanding that Jesus gave the command to any would-be disciples, according to Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Get it out there to everybody. It is with that understanding that people like Paul and the rest of his band of brothers labored and, and struggled to raise up churches all over the world. It's amazing how many churches that Paul was able to plant during his ministry, which is his, his band of brothers. You know, Paul, according to Colossians chapter one, verse 29, wrote to this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. 
When it came to Paul, Paul's mission flowed from God's mission. Both Jesus and Paul, they were, they were both committed to God's mission. How about us as members of the Midpoint Ministry Center? Are we committed to his mission? That's the question. You know, does what we do as a ministry center flow from God's mission? Is it our understanding and our conviction that God wants nothing more than the earth to be filled with people from all nations living in worship of him, praising his name? Is it our understanding and our conviction that that's God's mission? I believe that throughout the years, many of you as disciples have been committed to God's mission. You know, you've reached out to numbers of people and studied the Bible with numbers of people as a result of you being committed to God's mission. You know, amazingly, some of the people that you personally reached out to and personally studied the Bible with are currently worshiping God with you right now through this virtual worship service. Or perhaps right now or, or later in today, or maybe it's already happened, you know, but they, they're worshiping God virtually in some other city or perhaps some other nation where God has sent them. They're worshiping God there. Either way, I'm talking about people from all sorts of different racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds who are now living their lives in worship of God simply because you were committed to his mission. Again, I believe that throughout the years, many of us as disciples have been committed to God's mission. The fact that you are a disciple today is because someone was committed to God's mission. However, I believe that some of us as disciples have stopped being committed to God's mission. I believe that some of us have, as disciples have stopped seeing ourselves within the great flow of God's mission. We stop seeing how we play a part in God's mission. Brothers and sisters, God wants every one of us as disciples to play a part in his mission. He wants us to know the story we are a part of. The great story of the Bible going back to Abraham. The fact is, if you are a disciple today, you, like Abraham, are a part of the great story of God's mission to reconcile the world back to himself. I'll say that again. The fact is, if you are a disciple today, you, like Abraham, are a part of God's great story, the, the, the great story of God's mission to reconcile the world back to himself. How awesome is it, brothers and sisters, to be playing a part in God's mission? How, how, how privileged are you and I, brothers and sisters, to be playing a part in God's mission? How grateful ought we be, brothers and sisters, to be playing a part in God's mission? And likewise, how committed ought we to be to be playing a part in God's mission? God doesn't want us to stop seeing how we play a part in his mission. Like we play a part, you play a part in God's mission. He doesn't want you to stop seeing how he wants to use you to advance his mission. God wants to use you to advance his mission. Like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus himself, God has chosen to advance his mission through you and me, brothers and sisters. Like, that's, that blows my mind. But the question is, are we committed to his mission? Are we committed to his mission? In closing, I want to close out my sermon by having us turn to uh, Revelation chapter 7 in your Bibles. In Revelation chapter 7, the Apostle John was given a, a vision of what would come at the end of history. He's given this vision of what would come at the end of history and told to write it down. When most of us think the book of Revelation is kind of strange and has all these symbols and images or what have you, we got to understand, because tucked into Revelation, the, the revelation given to John is an incredible picture of the, the culmination of God's mission since the dawn of creation. You know, and it's important to connect what we what is revealed will happen in heaven, according to Revelation chapter seven, which we'll read here soon. It's important to connect that with what God started in Genesis chapter 12 in the life of Abraham. And so Revelation chapter seven, we're going to read verse nine through 12 from the Bible. It reads, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes 
and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, at the end of history, at the end of the ages, as to, to echo what Jesus said in the, his great commission, right? At the culmination of God's mission, there will be representatives in heaven from every nation, tribe, people, and language bowing and worshiping at God's feet. And I want to say that again. At the culmination of God's mission, there will be a representative in heaven for every nation, tribe, people, and language bowing and worshiping at God's feet. In other words, heaven will be very multicultural. So much going on. But the reason why this will be the case in heaven is because God, the great missionary that he is, has been on a mission. God has one mission, and this mission is for there to be a great multitude that no one can, can count. No one can, that no one could count how many people from every nation, tribe, people, and language are going to be standing before his throne and before the Lamb. As members of the Midpoint Ministry Center, as children of God because of Jesus, as children of Abraham because of our faith, let's be committed to joining God in the great flow of his mission to bring representatives from every nation, tribe, people, and language before his throne and before the Lamb of God in heaven. Let's, let's be committed to, to joining God, being missionaries with God. Let's be committed to his mission and, and let's stop sitting on the sidelines, not playing our part. We have a part to play. You have a part to play in what God has called us to do. We got to stop sitting off the sidelines. Let's be committed to God's mission and may we do so boldly and wholeheartedly. And let the church say amen in the chat group. Amen. And to God be the glory. If you're a guest joining us virtually, we're so glad you found us. If you want to find out more about the Midpoint Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ, if you want to grow in your walk with God, if you want to connect with us, you can find a link to a virtual connection form in the video description below. So make sure to go there, click on it, fill it out. We can't wait to hear from you.